Hello, Hello and welcome to the Wirecast Show, episode 7 on February 22nd, 2023. My name is Don Keani and I'm joined here by Scott Murray and Lynn Elliott. How are you doing, guys? Hello. Hi, Don. How's the weather over there? I hear you guys are getting <laughs> hammered with some snow and a little bit of frigidness over there, right? Uh, not yet, but we did, just for those in the audience, we did pre-record this show on the off chance that we wouldn't be able to make it into the studio because we're supposed to get some really nasty weather. However, it has not arrived yet. I think it's coming at 10 o'clock tonight or something. So we're live. Yes, so we are officially live. For now, that is. Uh, but yeah, I think uh, we, we got a really great, uh, interesting show for folks today. We're talking all about switchers, hardware switchers, software switchers like Wirecast, what you need to know uh, about the differences between them and how to you know, decide which one makes the most sense for your next production. Um, so before we dive into that, uh, we did have a comment on our last live show mentioning LUTs and Wirecast again. Uh, Lynn wanted to uh, get your take on that. We've been getting a lot of comments about LUTs. Is that uh, something that's on the horizon potentially? Yes, I can't say too much, but we are actively working on it. And I am uh, hopeful that we will have that in our next major release. Uh, so yes, it is something that I'm aware this is one of our biggest requested features and we really want to get it in and so we're working on it. Awesome. Great. And Scott, you recently had an article posted in Forbes about hosting virtual events. I mm -hmm. thought it was a really interesting read uh, and uh, definitely uh, recommend people checking it out. But uh, any, any quick tips, any quick hits that you want to tease people with to get them to go check out that article? Oh, it's, uh, I don't know, it's in interesting from my perspective, but the <laughs> real thing is, is do you want to go live or do you want to do a simulated live? And there are pros and cons in both of those. And so I'd recommend checking out the article because it talks about when to use one versus the other. Uh, live is stressful. Sim live is a lot easier, but then you don't get the live interaction like what we have right now. Right. So there's pros and cons of both. And that's a little bit of discussion inside the article. Awesome. So yeah, so uh, I put out a post on our YouTube channel right before this show with the link to that uh, to that article. Uh, for anyone who's interested, uh, go to our YouTube channel. You'll find a link to that, and you should be able to check out that article and, and give it a read after the show. Um, and uh, the other thing we've got going on right now is our big Gear 23 for 23 sale. So uh, right now our Wirecast Gear hardware products, which are you know fully flexible Windows PCs that are pre-configured for live streaming and video production, are all 23% off uh, until April 1st. So you know that for our 4K models, that's over 2,000 bucks you could save on a on a full Windows PC with video streaming and production capabilities. So um, definitely. Go check Good out sale. the website for yeah. Go check out the website for more information on that for sure. All right. So now with all that out of the way, let's get to uh, the heart of the matter here. We're here to talk about switchers. And um, Scott, Lynn, you guys are over at Nevada County Media, and right down the hall from you is actually the Grass Valley Tech Museum. We've got a whole bunch of you know slices of video production history over there. And and Scott, you actually did a a, a nice kind of prepackaged walkthrough memory lane type of segment uh, where you took a look at some of these switchers. So why don't we take a look at that? Okay. Let's go. Hey everyone, I'm Scott Murray with Telestream and I've spent a number of years in the broadcasting business and have a lot of hands-on experience dealing with different hardware used to produce video content. I'm here at the Grass Valley Tech History Museum at Nevada County Media where we can view a slice of history and see more about what switchers have done for us over the years. So let's put all this current technology into perspective with a very short trip down memory lane. First off, what is a production switcher or a vision mixer if you're from Europe? Switchers came about pretty much as soon as the very first TV producer asked the question, hey, can I get a second camera? And they quickly evolved to be the centerpiece of the production studio. So here's a classic example of one of the earliest production switchers. It has a program bus to select all of the input sources and a preview bus so you can see what's coming next. The fader bar is used to transition from the preview to the program. Or you can use it to fire your lasers on your Death Star and destroy planets. And <laughs> yes, this is the exact switcher that was used inside Star Wars. So above that are the effects buses 
that let you layer an image over your program. And that's basically the point here is to be able to create a real-time composite. As TV networks and technology evolved, we saw broadcasters develop their skills and up the ante with digital devices that had many, many inputs. In fact, the production switcher that was used at the Super Bowl just recently comes with 192 inputs. And man, that is a lot of video plumbing. We can't ignore graphics because graphics are a really important element and here you'll probably be connecting to outside graphic sources and capture those to a frame buffer to put on air. Things like lower thirds, pop-ups on screen, a rolling ticker, they can all be layered on the fly and sent out to your broadcast with something like this. Now keep in mind, when this was built, you had to use a DVE or digital video effects device coupled with a keyer to overlay one video picture over another. So this sort of production value was very, very pricey, but it lets you have multiple cameras side by side, plus some graphics coming in from your CG. And then you could pull the fader and switch to a completely different setup with a new camera angle and overlays. And that's some real processing power, but this brings me to the downside of production switchers. You're limited by what is built into the hardware. You really don't get third-party plugins and software expansion for these. They're designed to do one job really, really well. And that is making a lot of sources accessible, think of 192 inputs, all at once in compositing them in real time. So this should give you a sense of what was involved in running these and how much easier it has become. A lot of these ideas found here are now incorporated into tools like Wirecast. But I, for one, really appreciate Nevada County Media for maintaining this little slice of TV history. Great. Thanks for that, Scott. A lot of really interesting tidbits of information there. And, you know, I know for me personally, having never really seen that kind of hardware side of video production, it was really cool to see just how hefty these pieces of machinery can be um i think uh, i think now that we kind of got that sense of history it's, it'd be good to kind of drill down a little bit deeper explore the differences between those production switchers and some of the software available on the market today and kind of what people need to think about as they go into planning their le next live production um so first things first i think we covered at a high level the difference between the hardware and the software switchers but you know what is kind of the, the fundamental difference between uh, a, a software like Wirecast versus a, a hardware-based production switcher? You know, what's the, the kind of crux of the matter that people need to think about when it comes to comparing the two? Yeah, thanks, Don. So the crux of the matter, there's a couple of things. One of them is hardware production switchers. They're great for doing a lot of plumbing. I, I like to call it video plumbing. So if you have 10 inputs or you have 24 inputs or like at the Super Bowl, 192 inputs. They're great for plumbing because they have internal audio or video routing inside them. And then they have hardware based layering capabilities where they do keying and they have DVEs built inside them. And so you have the capabilities of blending those and building up a composited image, which is what production switchers do. They don't just switch cameras or graphics anymore. They actually do some layering. But if you look at the size of them, for a four mix effect switcher, for example, one mix effect may have six keys on it. Well, if you want 12 keys, which is quite popular these days, or even more, you have to have re-entry. So that's why you have these multiple banks on a production switcher to re-enter to be able to create this composited layer. So the physical hardware within the switcher gives you the ability to do a certain amount of work, whereas software production switchers are pretty flexible. So you, the fundamental paradigm between a software switcher like Wirecast and a hardware switcher is that we approach this at the beginning of a layering paradigm. We know you want to composite all kinds of images together to create a fundamental shot. And that's what you do with a production switcher. You have to re-enter in multiple Emmys and that's where you get lots of buttons and lots of complexity. So hardware, you kind of got what you got software. It's expandable. For example, we added NDI inputs uh, a couple of releases ago. We've got SRT outputs now. Lynn talks about LUTs for color correction. Those are software additions that can be added. And so the real fundamental thing is hardware, you get what you get, and they're really good at what they do. But 
they're really not expandable when it comes to adding new technology. So rendezvous, this we're bringing UNV and rendezvous. That was never done many, many years ago uh, until just recently. We could bring you in as a guest. Now we want to stream out live. We're streaming right now to Facebook and YouTube simultaneously. We could stream out to additional uh, destinations as well. Hardware switchers, they're pretty fixed with what they do, but they do it really, really well. Yeah, and you know, you talked about how those hardware switchers can have you know hundreds of inputs, you know, for all different types of sources, right? Um, I think the other thing to think about, you mentioned this layering paradigm. Anyone who's used, you know. Uh, an image editing software like Photoshop or a video editing tool like ScreenFlow or Pre Adobe Premiere, for example, or anything like that should kind of be used to this concept of layering things on top of each other. And if you need to, you know, key out certain things, you can apply that and the, the, the bit below shines through the stuff on top and all of that. Um, but the other benefit, I think, to the software based switchers is you don't necessarily need to have a whole bunch of distinct inputs on those layers to do that. You can create composite shots within single you know, shot layers within Wirecast, for example, and have really advanced kind of shots and productions ready to go at the click of a mouse button. Right, and what's really important to understand is in the history, uh, you looked at you know, two cameras. You needed to find a way to transition between the cameras. So you had a fade, and then they added white patterns to be able to provide an on-air look and a differentiation. And when they introduced the heart wipe, it was like, whoa, <laughs> that's a big deal, the heart wipe. But then DVEs came into being in like the 80s and 90s, and the, tr the on-air look for the three networks, CBS, ABC, NBC, they created these transitions with ripples and curls, and the DVE provided the on-air look. Then graphics came into being, and then nowadays, if you actually look at, let's say the Super Bowl, take that for example, or the World Cup, you have all kinds of graphical layers that are built into building out a single shot. You can have, uh, boy, 10 or 20 different graphical layers. Look at next time, it's very subtle. But what happens with production switchers is you may run out of hardware real estate to be able to put all those layers on simultaneously. So with software, you can actually have the embedded titler built in, bring all the titles on, composite a shot, and you're good to go. Yeah, and beyond that, you know, being able to integrate stock media, right? Like having right. all of those stock media sources as distinct files that you're having to pull into a hardware switcher versus, a, you know, a piece of software like Wirecast, which has a built-in stock media library. I think there's a lot of value and, you know, flexibility and nimbleness to be gained from using that software. But like you said, if you know exactly what you're going to put on air at a given time and you just want to have it right there, the hardware switcher can bring that in no problem, I think. And, and you actually had a pretty good comparison slide that like looks at the differences and the overlap between the software and the, and the hardware kind of switchers. So uh, why don't we throw that up real quick and have that to look at while we're talking through some of these differences a little bit. Um, but I think, you know, beyond the stock media support, you mentioned NDI. You know, that's something we've heard a lot of commentary about recently, especially on our live shows. Um, you know, talk a little bit more about how, you know, NDI can enable these more advanced productions with, uh, with Wirecast. Well, yeah, I mean, NDI uh, is... Uh, we hear a lot about NDI recently, just people are bringing them in to expand the capabilities of the hardware that they have in many cases. So with something like Wirecast or with a, a PC or a Mac computer, uh, you might have a certain number of inputs that you want to use. Uh, NDI will expand that. If you have the capability in your computer, then uh, it's easy to bring in additional, you know, two, three, four, maybe, you know, even six NDI feeds uh, to really beef up your production. And you don't need the additional hardware inputs to bring those in. Yeah. And on top of NDI, you know, uh, some of the other unique capabilities in software, like you mentioned, Scott, because the software is able to adapt over time to evolving, you know, needs and demands from the customers and the users and that sort of thing. You know, you got PTZ control, you've got, you know, a, a, a interaction with, you know, computer screens and web applications and all of that kind of stuff that you might not necessarily be able to do with kind of the hardware production switchers of the olden days, right? Yeah, this is really, uh, bring that slide back up, Brendan. This is a, a really great slide to kind of point out. Um, 
And if you look in the center, both of the production switcher and the software switchers are capable of doing fundamental things like switching and keying and doing some DVE repositioning. Um, and we talked about production switchers' unique capabilities, which uh, boils down to a lot of video plumbing and it's hardware-based. Um, and we love production switchers. In fact, we've got a couple here when we come out of our shot here. We can, we can show you this one here. We, this is the A10 Mini Pro. Mm -hmm. And this one is great if you're starting out to do in a first show. Hey, great, it's got four inputs and you can put an output and you can do rudimentary picture of picture. Yeah. Um, Loading graphics. You can load a graphic, uh, a graphic and do a couple yeah. of wipes. But um, you know, this is a great little switcher for starting out. And then as you get into more production capabilities, let's say you wanna stream to YouTube and Facebook like we're doing right now. There's nothing to preclude you from taking the output of this and bringing it into Wirecast and then using Wirecast for the downstream capabilities of all the software functionality. You can do all the keying and chroma keying and, and, and multiple destinations and streaming and stock media and you can do all kinds of stuff. So you can use the two simultaneously. And we have a lot of people that do that actually. And one of the benefits of that is to distribute the workflow a little bit. And so if you have two people that you want to be working on the same show, one person can be switching the cameras using something like this and then feed that switched feed into Wirecast. And then the Wirecast operator is handling, you know, the graphics, the social media comments, the stream itself, and any other things that, you know, may be part of the production. But it allows for a little distribution. So not one person is having to do everything. Yeah, I think that's a that's a really important thing to note, right? Is that you don't it's not necessarily always a a binary choice between software and hardware, right? right? You can use both of them in conjunction with each other and kind of get the best of both worlds. Like over there you guys are uh connecting Wirecast with the Stream Deck and using that Stream Deck to kind of like automate triggering shots and macros and that sort of thing, right? Well, that's the other thing too, is that I think with a hardware switcher, one of the benefits or one of the things that people like about it is that tactile feel of having the buttons. You know, you're pushing a button, you see something happen. And so, you know, if you're doing it with a keyboard, that's, you know, it might be a different feel, but that's the thing with software switchers is that you can also integrate these control surfaces. Like we have a, a X keys here that a lot of people use. We we use that also, and we also use a stream deck. Um, and so that gives you that tactile feel uh, with the software. And so it, it's just, software is, is very flexible in that way. You can add and, and integrate a lot of different things. Yeah, and there's something about hardware too, is people think that hardware switchers don't crash. People think software's <laughs> unreliable. <laughs> Uh, I have some scars on my back from one of the production switchers crashing on air because of some software problems uh, at an NFC championship game. It crashed. It was a Fox feed and it crashed on air and they had to go to a backup bypass routing switcher to switch the cameras while the switcher rebooted. Now that's that, you know, that that's been fixed. Um, so, but there are situations when the hardware switchers crash because fundamentally they have software on the inside that are driving them as well. So the reliability, it's kind of about the same between hardware and software. Yeah. And, you know, I think it, that's a good kind of opportunity to talk about Wirecast gear. You know, I mentioned it at the top of the show. It's on sale right now. That is, you know, our kind of, you know, marriage of the two worlds, so to speak, right? It's a, you know, a fully functional, flexible Windows PC. You can run your Microsoft Office, your Adobe Creative Suite, whatever you want on it. But it is also pre-configured and set up with Wirecast Pro and with all the horsepower and the, the plumbing, so to speak, that you need to uh, to do kind of a, a live event, a live stream like this without necessarily having to worry about the software crashing or the hardware not being able to support it, right? Yeah, and that's that's one thing. Going back to Scott's point about hardware will crash occasionally because it's it's made with software. You know, software uh, coming from the software development world. You know, a lot of the things that we do, uh, of course, we we don't want our software to crash. But a lot of the um, complication comes when we can't. Uh, test or anticipate what other kind of hardware people are going to use with our software. And so there's, you know, everything from 
$29 capture dongles out there that you buy on Amazon to, you know, $500 or $800 capture or audio mixers and that sort of thing, you know, and, and everything in between that you could potentially use with Wirecast and plug into your computer. And so that's where it gets complicated because sometimes there are, there are um, you know, hiccups or integration issues. And that's why we ended up making Wirecast gear because we wanted to kind of lock down the environment a little bit and make sure that for this capture card and this machine and with this GPU, we work and we're optimized for streaming. And so, I mean, on the one side, software is really flexible uh, in that you can put it on a computer and you can use that computer for other things. So it makes that hardware investment a little bit more useful for other things potentially. Whereas if you invest in a hardware switcher, that's basically, you know, that's it. You're using it for that purpose and, and you get it. So, you know, on the one hand, it, it is more flexible, but on the other hand, um, there are potential uh, mismatches or, you know, you, you really have to test out your workflow when you have your own computer and your own other hardware devices that you're using with it. There's another, there's another thing too, is that we've seen a huge change over the years in the video feeds. It started, when I started in this business, analog composite was the video source to use. It became analog component for production, which was better quality, but it was still analog. Next came digital, it was still, NTSC composite, you know, 525, 625 lines. And then we got into high definition, and now we're in the 4K world. But every single one of these transitions with hardware, you needed to throw out the old equipment, which included the router and the cameras and the switcher, and bring in all new equipment. If you have equipment that fundamentally expands as technology expands, and we're at a point where 4K now is coming in, and it's coming in via NDI, via network feeds, um, and there's baseband 4K videos, um, but you also need to support HD and backward compatible 1080p cameras. So one of the values of the software production switchers is that they can expand over time, especially if you've got a, a network pipe with network cameras coming in, you're pretty well um, future-proof if you have the software inside to decode the images coming in. Yeah, I think that's a that's a really good way of thinking about it, right? Is you know the software side of things is more for that flexibility and that future future-proofing aspect of it. You know, if you have all of these grand aspirations that you want to work up to in a live show down the line having the software component will enable you to do that and will kind of be kind of a supporter of your goals and getting to those points. Um, if you have a really crystal clear idea of the show you want to put on, you know exactly what it's going to be, you don't need to change much about it, you just got some sources coming in and you know how you're going to handle it, then hardware might be fine and might do the job for you, right? You don't necessarily need that, that software component if you've already made that hardware investment and you know exactly what you want your show to look like, right? Yeah. And a lot of people say software is, it's not stable. I mean, we've all seen the blue screen of death over the years, but fundamentally Windows has transitioned into, it really is like Linux on the inside, which is the operating system that most hardware runs on now is, is Linux. So uh, between Mac and Windows platforms, they're extremely stable. And occasionally you do get a crash. Uh, it's usually an app that crashes, but sometimes you'll end up with an OS crash. And if you have a real critical on-air situation, redundancy is substantially cheaper by going with a second computer and, and route your plumbing accordingly if you have a critical on-air need. Great. Awesome. So, okay, so let's let's kind of summarize things up a little bit and then uh, maybe take a look at a couple use cases. And before we head over to the audience Q&A and see what's coming in over the comments, I've been seeing our chat uh, been going off a little bit here on the YouTube and want to make sure we have some time to address some of those. So I think, you know, it, the, the kind of the fundamental differences between the hardware and the software comes down to, you know, what you're trying to accomplish with your live show, right? Whether you want the flexibility to do cool new things, add graphics, uh, stay up to date with new features and capabilities, um, do some more advanced layering and compositing versus the hardware side of things where you want that that plumbing, as you put it, Scott, you want the, the inputs, you want the outputs, you want everything to just kind of come in, feed into your show and go out the way you want it to go out, right? Those are kind of, I think, the, the, the main kind of delineation between the two if you're choosing between one or the other, but you can 
you know, get the best of both worlds, use them both together, use the hardware, use the software and get kind of the flexibility and the power uh, from both sides of the coin there. Um, and then I think it's worth mentioning, you know, on the on the hardware side, right? Like you mentioned with all the inputs, you know, a, a piece of software like Wirecast might not be able to handle 192 inputs like that switcher you showed, right? <laughs> Likely not. <laughs> Depends on the computer, I guess, but yeah. Yeah. Might be tough. And it also won't fire the lasers on your Death Star. So that's that's the other piece of the coin, right? Right. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. So um, I think one final tip, uh, you know, I'll leave people with just as a reminder. You know, we've got the uh, the uh, article on Forbes that Scott wrote about hosting a virtual event. Definitely give that a read if you want some more tips on how to, you know, make a different decision between hosting it live versus simulated live. Uh, and then, you know, that's a, a good you know, segue into deciding whether you use software or hardware to produce it and how you produce it and all that kind of thing. Um, and then, like I mentioned at the beginning of the show, we've got the gear uh, 23 for 23 sale going until April 1st. Definitely give that a look if you want a chance to save uh, thousands of dollars on a video production PC. All right. Any last points, you guys, before we take it to the audience Q&A? Um, the only point I have is you know, if you're starting off small, let's say you're a church, mm. start simple. Go ahead and buy something like this. But if you want to have a little bit more production capabilities, start simple with a simple show. Two cameras, three cameras, uh, build a simple uh, production at, using Wirecast, and then you can build upon that. It's important to have a vision for where you want to go but realize that most of the tools that you would invest in, you can expand those to be able to enhance your production capabilities. The one thing that you really need to think about is cameras. So if you're gonna build a, a, an installation from scratch, really fundamentally realize if you're gonna do an HD or 4K production. And I know you guys talked about 4K cameras on the last show, or your and NDI mm -hmm. cameras. You did a whole bunch on, so check out that show if you wanna get some tips on using uh, cameras. Great. Awesome. All right. So let's segue over to the audience Q&A portion. Uh, so we've got oh. a whole bunch of questions <laughs> on the YouTube stream. Uh, Q&A. And, <laughs> and, uh, Sorry. We just put up the, <laughs> the, the wrong. <laughs> That's okay. He, it's Q&A, not comments. It's hardware buttons. <laughs> yes. He pressed the wrong <laughs> button. <laughs> and, <laughs> now, again, another uh, another quirk with hardware, right? You got to worry <laughs> about which button you're pushing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. So one question from Ami Munir: uh, Can I use Wirecast as a video switcher without the need of a hardware video switcher? My main goal oh. is multi PTZ cameras, live streaming, and recording without live streaming. Oh yes, absolutely. We were just showing this A10 Mini as an example of. Uh, one workflow where you could separate it out and use that hardware for switching cameras. But absolutely, Wirecast is made for you to be able to switch with your mouse and keyboard. Uh, you can set up uh, keyboard shortcuts if you wanted to, to switch your shots, but you're absolutely able to do everything with a mouse and keyboard. And if you awesome. want to record the show without streaming, yeah, we did that yesterday. Right. <laughs> We've re we pre-recorded this. <laughs> And we did the show to disc in case we yeah. got hammered by a snowstorm, then we could press play and play out the whole show. Uh, the other thing which is interesting is you could ISO record all your cameras and yeah. the show, and you could pre uh, post edit the show if you needed to tweak it before sending it out. Right, that's one. And uh, I was just gonna go back to the idea of recording your show. That's, that's another common workflow that we hear about is people not streaming, but actually using this as a production tool so that it saves time in post-production. So they have their, their uh, show all switched basically and all their cuts already done. Uh, they ISO record just in case they have a mistake and want to go in and fix it. But once they've finished the show, it's basically done and ready to be posted. 
Yeah, I'll tell you what, when I was uh, the one-man marketing team over at Sherpa Digital Media, uh, I was a huge fan of pre-produced simulated live webinars. I'll tell you what, not having to deal with switching things live and monitoring the stream and just having a, a pre-produced video asset that I could upload and stream out as a simulated oh, live was come a- Come on, a, it's fun, that adrenaline rush, isn't oh, it? Oh man, when, you, when you're a one-man <laughs> band, then, that, then it's a little bit too nerve-wracking, I think. But yeah, that was a, a really good kind of load off of my, load off my back when, uh, when simulated <laughs> live became a thing, that's for sure. Awesome. Uh, all right, a question from Lawrence Mason. Since upgrading to 15.2, my CPU has been fluctuating sometimes as much as 100%. I did a live show on Saturday and my CPU wasn't stationary. I've never seen this before. Any tips that we can oh. provide to help stabilize CPU usage? Well, we have, uh, I know we have a knowledge base article on our website or in our knowledge base about things you can do to reduce your CPU. I mean, the, the basic tips are just close everything that's not necessary. Um, um, you know, look at your output settings and how you're encoding your stream. If you have a GPU and a dedicated like an NVIDIA GPU, you want to use NVENC encoding if possible or QuickSync encoding because that will take the encoding off of the CPU and onto the GPU. Um, there are some other tips on there. So um, we can maybe find that link and put it up in the show notes afterwards. But um, the other thing is that if this is happening in 15.2 and it didn't happen before, then maybe there's something we need to look at. So I would definitely reach out to our support team and give them this information. They'll probably ask for a copy of your support report so we can take a look at and see what's going on behind the scenes there. <clears throat> Yeah, and along those lines, Lynn, Wilton Vargas had a question. You know, Wilton. we mentioned, yeah, I know, our, our favorite guy, Wilton, yep. yeah. Um, mm -hmm. he, he mentioned, you know, and, and we talked about this, right? You know, sometimes the software crashes in, an, in a completely unideal world. It, it crashes during a live stream, right? Uh, yeah. Wilton mentions that if you're in a production and, and your software crash, it crashes, the only thing on your mind at that point is getting your stream back up, right? You're not really in a mode of, you know, trying to file a bug report and get support oh on the absolutely line and not kind of no so, so <laughs> yeah so any suggestions on how to report those issues after the fact and make sure you're encapsulating all of the info that a support person needs to be able to diagnose the issue yeah that's a great question um so in our uh, help menu, we have something called send support information. And when you click on that, it gives you an option to upload a report or send a report or save a report. Um, so what I would suggest is uh, certainly if you have a crash, always upload that for us because we get that in our backend system and we can see what the crash report was. We can see how many people have had that crash. We can see what version is, hap is on that crash. And we can also see kind of in the code where that crash happened. We don't always know why it happened, um, but that helps us. So anytime you have a crash, it's helpful for us if you upload that at some point. It doesn't have to be right after the crash happens. So that support information gets saved. Um, and I don't know actually how long it's saved for, but you know, a, at least a week or more. So depending on how many sessions you do. So it's not urgent that you upload it right after the crash. Ideally, it would be nice if you would contact support and they will probably ask you for this support information zip file is a zip file and if you have any if you can remember any steps that you were taking before the crash happened or what you were doing when that crash happened that would help us because ultimately our goal is that we want to be able to reproduce that crash in-house because then we'll know that uh, we can reproduce it uh, or when we fix it we know that we can take those steps and, and ensure that we've actually fixed that crash. So upload your support information, contact support. They may ask for it again. Uh, and then remember any, any steps that you took beforehand. And ideally, if you can reproduce it yourself, if it's 100% reproducible, that is, we love you for that. <laughs> we will give you a little sticker. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. All right. And then uh, before the show went live, we had a fellow by the name of Charles Nolan who was asking about our countdown clock. Uh, it seems like he really enjoyed it and he wanted to explain <laughs> how we did that, whether it was live or whether that was pre-produced and 
how he can do that for his show. So I think the answer to that is both, right? Oh, well, yeah. So I can tell you how we set up our shot there. So we put a play playlist together and one shot it's consists of two shots one shot is a just a background image uh it's background music and it's the countdown clock and then the second shot is that roll-in video which is about a 10 second video that kind of starts the show off and so when we go live we set that countdown clock we reset it to 10 minutes and we just send that whole playlist live and so it starts counting down and then as soon as uh, we have that shot set to be for 10 minutes long and as soon as that 10 minute clock gets done it goes on to the next shot which is the pre-roll and then we have it set up to uh, just make our preview window live once that whole playlist gets done. Let's see awesome. you do that in a hardware production switcher. <laughs> I know, right? Yeah, that, that, that would, I can, I can hear the hairs raising on the, on the production text or being asked <laughs> to do something like that on a piece of hardware. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Uh, and then we've got a, a handful of comments in here from Dennis and from Elwin. Uh, helping out some other folks and chiming in on their workflows. Appreciate the the commentary and the feedback there. Definitely keep comments coming. We'd love to hear about how you guys uh, use Wirecast and your video production workflows. And um, we love the interaction that we're getting there. Um, but yeah, I think that's all I'm seeing in terms of questions and comments from the audience. Um, I'll just wrap things up by saying just a reminder, check out uh, Scott's post on Forbes for virtual events and, and how to host a, an engaging virtual event, whether it's live or simulated live. Uh, check out Wirecast gear during the 23 for 23 sale to save a, a chunk of change on a, on a powerful PC. Uh, and uh, yeah, take a, take a look at Wirecast, download a free trial if you haven't yet, and see how a software switcher can help ramp up production value for your next live video production. Um, Scott, Lynn, anything else you guys want to wrap up with? Stay warm. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we're gonna get snow today, so <laughs> it's gonna be. Yeah. Good. We're supposed to get like up to three feet of snow here in the next couple of days in Nevada City area, so it, it could be a winter wonderland again. Well, Amen. winter's not over yet, so yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm glad the stream uh, held up for for this long, and uh, I think uh, now is a good time to kind of wrap things up. And uh, thanks everyone for watching. Stay tuned next month for the next episode of the Wirecast Show. And uh, hope to see you there. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.